All right. So, continuing where we left off, uh, as a bit of a review, last SI session we talked about the different ways enzyme activity could actually be regulated. There are some ways that speed up enzyme activity, some ways that slow it down. The very first one that is talked about in chapter 15 is a mechanism called covalent modification, where we learned that an enzyme's activity can change when a phosphate group is covalently attached to an enzyme or removed from an enzyme. It changes, it changes the fundamental activity uh, speed of that enzyme. Uh, later on in the notes, you're going to see that phosphate isn't the only thing that could possibly be, possibly be covalently attached to an enzyme. Uh, so covalent modification, uh, don't uh, just think that it's only phosphates that can be covalently added. It could be a bunch of different things. Uh, later on, we're going to see that cyclic AMP, when it is covalently attached to something, regulates the activity of that enzyme. So bottom line with covalent modification, enzyme activity changes by changing, by attaching something covalently or removing it. The other thing we talked about in terms of regulation of enzyme activity was a category of regulation called zymogen activation, of which your notes give you three examples of. Again, zymogen activation, to simplify what it really means, is that in this example, you have a pre-enzyme structure called, in this example, pro-insulin. Pro-insulin, it is like a uh, inactive version of the enzyme. The way zymogen activation of this enzyme works is that it cuts away a part of this pre-enzyme, leaving behind a smaller fragment of it, which it turns out is the actual active form of the enzyme. So again, zymogen activation is where you cleave something off a pre-structure and the shorter stuff left over is your actual active form of that enzyme. This is an example for insulin. Uh, your notes give you two other examples. It turns out that the enzymes trypsin and chymotrypsin are also activated via zymogen activation. Uh, with, and basically, to simplify it, it's the same thing, is that there's this pre-stuff here. You, uh, in this example, it removes these uh, pink-labeled amino acid residues, and the shorter stuff that's left over is the actual active version of the enzyme. Now, conceptually, why would we need to have zymogen activation of these enzymes? Why not just make trypsin and chymotrypsin active from the start? Why does it need to be inactive from the, from the beginning? And here's why. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are mainly used in the small intestine. Whoops. Hopefully that's still good. All right. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are mainly used in the small intestine. But they're released from the pancreas. If trypsin and chymotrypsin were active to start with, if they were active to start with, then they're just going to go and cut up any protein they run into starting from the pancreas, which is a bad thing. So the reason why we have zymogen activation of trypsin and chymotrypsin is that they're initially made in the pancreas in an inactive form, get shipped off to the small intestine, and only when it reaches the small intestine is it activated via zymogen activation. Then it's active form of trypsin and chymotrypsin, and it goes and it cleaves whatever targets it needs to cleave. Okay, so this, this is a level of control of enzyme activity to make sure it isn't doing things it's not supposed to. The last example of zymogen activation they talk about is uh, your clotting factors, is uh, you know, how, your, how uh, blood clots uh, uh, form and how injuries heal, right? And the main thing here is, is that there are several zymogen activation steps with this one, rather than just 
one step in the previous two examples. There's a cascade, and obviously they didn't really draw anything. They're just labeling and saying, yeah, there's like one, two, three, four, five, or maybe six, six steps in this zymogen activation thing, and each one boosts the activity of these blood clotting factors. That's about it. You don't need to know anything more specific than that, okay? So that's where we left off last time. Today we're gonna to move on to the other ways <coughs> enzyme activity can be regulated. And this one, I don't know if there's a real category for it, but I just call this uh, area of the notes here the isozymes, isozymes. So what isozymes are is, uh, remember in chapter six, we learned that uh, uh, a lot of proteins can be made of several subunits, right? We learned about the phrases homomultimer, heteromultimer, stuff like that, right? What that means is that some enzymes and other proteins are made of multiple subunits, and putting these subunits together give you an overall functional enzyme. What an isozyme is, is a special enzyme that can be made different ways. So what I'm going to state here is all one, two, three, four, five examples here are all the exact same uh, enzyme of lactate dehydrogenase. If it's not labeled here, that's a, oh, here we go, yeah. These are all the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. But they differ in which subunits make up each version of lactate dehydrogenase. These are isomer you can think of it as they're they're very similar to isomers of each other but the term we use in enzyme stuff is uh, isozymes they're very similar to each other just made of different subunits and they label these subunits the a sub the a or alpha subunit and the b or beta subunit and you can see that that gives you five possible combinations here right so what does this mean? Well, it turns out, depending on what number of each subunit you have, it actually changes how this enzyme catalyzes the reaction. So what, this rea what the, the, the reaction this enzyme catalyzes is the, the conversion of pyruvate to lactate, or the opposite, lactate to pyruvate. So it can actually catalyze both directions in this, in this reaction, going from left to right or right to left. But what determines which direction it catalyzes is how many of each subunit it has. And I always forget which one's which, so let me take a look here. Uh, if this version of the enzyme is found in muscle cells, it actually goes from left to right. It converts pyruvate into lactate. So let's see, where is that in our example here? Here's a muscle, uh, here's the muscle cell here. And look at that, it prefers to, it prefers a lot more A subunits. So the lactate dehydrogenase, and you don't have to memorize that, this is just to illustrate what isozymes mean, is that in certain tissues, lactate dehydrogenase is made of maybe four A subunits or three A subunits, and that pushes the reaction it catalyzes from left to right in this example. It, it causes it to catalyze the reaction of converting pyruvate into lactate. The opposite, is also, the opposite example is also given here, is that if you find the exact same enzyme in the heart, it actually is made of a bunch of B subunits in this illustration. And if you read the notes here, and a lot of answers can be found in the captions of these figures, if you read this, you, you find out that it actually catalyzes the opposite. It, 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 it makes pyruvate from lactate. It pushes the reaction from right to left. So isozymes describes a certain category of enzymes that, are, that can be made out of different numbers of subunits and catalyze different directions on a reaction. So it's multifunctional. It's a way to regulate enzyme activity in, in two different ways just simply with what subunits it's made of. Okay. There, again, have to stress that they're the exact same uh, named enzyme in all of these tissues. They're just made of different ratios of subunits, and therefore it pushes the reaction in one way or the other. Okay. <clears throat> this one is another example of covalent modification. I don't really know why it's all the way down here in the notes, but this is another example of covalent modification, and here's, here's why. So. So like I said earlier, covalent modification isn't just covalently attaching phosphates and covalently removing phosphates. Covalent modification in this example is covalently uh, attaching or removing, well, uh, if you go in certain directions here, 
the molecule cyclic AMP, okay? So because you're covalently modifying your target, it's still classified as covalent modification. What this enzyme is, is a, uh, and I might get the acronym wrong, it's, I think it's protein kinase A or, or something like that. Uh, basically, this enzyme right here, the, the represented by the R groups there, goes and phosphorylates a bunch of target proteins. But this protein itself needs to be activated as well. Unfortunately, in biology, things are complicated that things phosphorylate things which go to phosphorylate other things which go to phosphorylate other things. It's a series of reactions. It's a pathway. So this enzyme is actually one of the more famous enzymes in biology in that uh, when it's activated, it will go phosphorylate and activate a whole series of enzymes. But itself, it, the enzyme itself needs to be activated. In the illustration, the way it is activated is some modifying enzyme goes and, and covalently attaches cyclic AMP to it and removes the, uh, and removes the regulatory subunits off of it. And therefore you have, and I, I might have misspoken the wrong letter earlier, you have the active form of the enzyme referred to as uh, C, the catalytic part of the enzyme. So you have covalently modified this enzyme by attaching uh, some molecule to it. You've modified its structure into an active form of that enzyme. Uh, let's see, do you know to give you the name of the enzyme that attaches cyclic AMP? No, it doesn't. I think it's something like uh, adenylyl cyclase or something, uh, but you know, that might be too specific for, for what you need for the exam. Uh, when the exam date comes a little bit closer and, it, and we find out if you need to know it specifically, I'll give you that information. Bottom line, this is another example of covalent modification. Again, I haven't seen him really specifically ask anything about this pathway. And let's see if I was right here. Not exactly, no, it's like adenylyl cyclase just makes cyclic AMP. I don't know what enzyme actually attaches it to it, so don't worry about it. He doesn't ask specific stuff like this, and if he happens to, I will go over it at the exam review before the, before the actual exam. All right, more regulatory stuff. Uh, metabolic pathways. So this isn't really a category itself as more of like an illustration of how uh, regulating one enzyme might affect a lot of different things. So, well, so a lot of times when they talk about regulation via metabolic pathway, the most common way that it's regulated is through something called feedback inhibition. Feed feedback inhibition, what that really means is that a product of a, of a reaction ends up inhibiting the very first enzyme in the pathway, or earlier enzyme in the pathway is what I should say. So feedback inhibition is where the product at the end of the pathway inhibits the beginning of the pathway. What does that mean bio biologically? So when enzymes are used to make product, when enzymes are, are used to catalyze reactions that make products, you don't want to make products indefinitely. You don't want to make products infinitely. Otherwise, your cell is wasting energy. Why make more product than what your cell needs? So what feedback inhibition is, is that the, by making the product, that product itself is going to communicate with the very beginning of the pathway and tell it to stop making more product. So it's, a, it's like a self-regulation. That is what feedback inhibition is. Uh, sometimes Dr. Hasey gives, gives an analogy of like an assembly line. I don't know if he gave that this semester, but uh, to try to tie into that analogy, what this means is that each enzyme is like a step in an assembly line to, come, to build a car, right? The first enzyme might make the frame of the car, some other one might put the wheels on, some other one might screw the, the, the bolts on, whatever. Some might put the windows on, whatever. By the time you get to the end, you have a fully formed car. The person that made this fully formed car is going to need to communicate with the first guy in the assembly line and say, stop gathering frames for cars. We don't need any more cars. So that's sort of his analogy of feedback inhibition is that there's an assembly line. When you make the product, the product itself actually inhibits the production of more product. And well, then how does this thing turn back on? Well. If the product ends up getting used for what purpose, for whatever purpose it was made for, then there's no more product. And so if there's no more product, there's nothing inhibiting the first enzyme anymore. Therefore, the whole thing turns on again. All right, so this is what feedback inhibition is. 
And we'll go over an example of that, of a pathway uh, in the worksheet in a second. All right, now we get to one of the bigger topics in terms of enzyme regulation. Uh, we learned in chapter 13 about a category of enzymes called michaelis menten enzymes, right? Those are enzymes that you can define as having one active site and one allosteric site. And therefore, there's only one place on that enzyme a substrate can bind to. There's a whole other category of enzymes called allosteric enzymes. And it, unfortunately, the name sounds very similar to allosteric site. Uh, you're just going to have to ignore that when we're talking about allosteric enzymes. The definition of that it has uh, is allosteric enzymes have multiple active sites and multiple allosteric sites. Uh, in fact, let me look for an illustration here first. This is what an allosteric enzyme uh, looks like, and it looks pretty crazy, right? Uh, each of these uh, shapes here could represent a site for substrate or could represent a site for some regulator molecule, whatever. Uh, but let me simplify it for you. So. What an allosterically regulated enzyme is, or an allosteric enzyme is, is, a, is an enzyme made of multiple active sites and multiple allosteric sites. Because of this, it actually causes the enzyme to have two possible states it could be in. So allosteric enzymes can either be in the shape and form of an inactive uh, tense enzyme, those are synonyms for each other when we're talking about allosteric enzymes, or it can be in the active quote, relaxed form of the enzyme. So, and this is only for allosteric en enzymes. Michaelis menten enzymes don't have this shift between two states. Allosteric enzymes are constantly, they are in some form of equilibrium between some of them being active and some of them being inactive. So it's a, it's a very unique way to control activities of allosteric enzymes is that they're, if I'm going to make something up. It's like we can have an allosteric enzyme that's 50% of, of that allosteric enzyme population is active and the other 50% is inactive. And the conditions in the cell will push it one way or the other. All right. So again, make sure you memorize these uh, words and vocabulary words in association with allosteric enzymes. You know, active is basically the same thing as the relaxed form or the R form. Inactive is the same thing as the tense form or the T form. This is very important, especially if we talk about uh, allosteric enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase, which we will in a second. Now to go back one slide, how does this actually affect uh, the reaction rate or, enzyme or, or, or control of reaction rate? So we learned with Michaelis menten enzymes, you, you see this dotted line, that reaction rate apparently follows what is called algebraically a hyperbolic shape on the, on the, on the curve. We learned with, uh, with Michaelis menten enzymes that, you can, that there's a Vmax associated with it, that if you add some substrate, uh, the enzyme no longer can go any, uh, uh, cannot exceed the Vmax speed because it's reached saturation. Allosteric enzymes, when you plot their uh, reaction rate versus substrate concentration on a graph, it makes this shape here, this sigmoid shape. And in fact, I'm gonna exaggerate a bit to, to make a point here. Of, what, of the difference. Okay. So Michaelis menten enzymes, you had this shape of a graph. Notice it's at least somewhat continuous, right? You increase substrate concentration, activity increases a little bit at a time until it reaches some maximum. This is for Michaelis menten enzymes. But for allosterically regulated enzymes, I'm going to exaggerate the shape here. Uh, you kind of have this S shape. What this is, is, a, is describing that the enzyme has an on state and an off state. Up here, you've reached the maximum rate that an allosteric enzyme can, can catalyze a reaction. This is the quote unquote on state of the allosteric enzyme. But look down here, even if you add tons of substrate, if you're at this range, the allosteric enzyme is off. That's kind of what the S shape is trying to illustrate to you, is that allosteric enzymes are either basically at max speed or off. That is what an allosteric enzyme is. There's a very small portion in here where if you increase the substrate concentration or decrease the substrate concentration slightly, it changes the speed, but that's such a small portion on here, it's, it's practically insignificant. 
This might look similar to those uh, titration curves that you see in general chemistry, right? Where if you add a little bit of, of base or something, uh, very suddenly the pH changes wildly. So similarly, the, what the shape is illustrating here uh, speed-wise is that allosteric enzymes are either basically at max speed or completely off. There's very little in between. Again, contrast that with Michaelis Menten enzymes where you have like this nice increasing uh, gradient here of speed with substrate concentration until it reaches a maximum. So uh, this allows allosteric enzymes to be closely regulated via, via uh, some type of mechanism. Maybe, if, for example, if the substrate is present, most likely it's going to be shifted to maximum speed so it can process that substrate as fast as possible. And if the substrate isn't present, the enzyme is most likely going to be off because why bother wasting energy if there is no uh, substrate to be processed. So that's uh, contrasting allosteric enzymes and Michaelis menten enzymes. Going back to the notes here. Okay, this is one of the figures that trips up a lot of people. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this and talk about each step by hand. Uh, don't worry about like all the, don't worry about the name of this theory or anything, the Monod, Wyman, whatever that is. Uh, basically what you need to know is the following. All right. All right. So. What that figure was, was describing how allosteric enzymes are uh, regulate, like how do they know when to be active or inactive, right? So in the, one of the earlier slides, we saw that there was only two forms of this enzyme. There was an R form and a T form. Uh, which one was the active form? R, right? So relaxed, active. And this one is tense and inactive. So we'll start there, very simple. And remember this double arrow here represents equilibrium. There's uh, always, when you look at a, a bunch of this allosteric enzyme, whatever enzyme it is, some of it is active, some of it is inactive, always. There is always some amount of both of these floating around in the cell. However, what happens when a substrate all of a sudden comes in? The substrate is only going to be able to bind to the, to the active form of the enzyme, right? So uh, what that ends up ha uh, doing is it ends up producing an enzyme substrate complex, very similar to Michaels Benten enzyme. So that still happens, is that the enzyme binds to its substrate at one of its many active sites. So I need to stress that. So allosteric enzymes have many, many active sites. I'm not going to draw uh, any of them. You can look at your notes for pictures for that. I'm just simplifying it here. So the substrate only prefers to bind to the active form of the enzyme. And in doing so, it causes, it causes, uh, it, it, it makes it so that you use up the active form of the enzyme. You are using up the active form of the enzyme to produce this, this complex down here. Do we remember with like, uh, what do they call it? The, the French guy's name, Le Chatelier's principle or something like that, how equilibrium shifts one way or the other when you mess with products and reactants, right? Well, let's see what's going on here. If a substrate is going to bind to this active form of the enzyme and use it up, there is now less of the active form of this enzyme. What ends up happening to this equilibrium is that if there's less of this, equilibrium is gonna to shift to the left. Does that make sense? Is that simply, by, simply the substrate being present and simply it binding to the, to the active enzyme and using it up is gonna cause this equilibrium up here to shift to the left. What that means is some of the inactive form just floating around is going to shift and become active form because there isn't enough active form floating around. So this is how allosteric enzyme regulation works, is that this interplay between some population of active and some population of inactive and how it shifts in one direction or the other. In the example given in that PowerPoint uh, slide, they're gonna, they start simply by saying if the substrate is present, there is less active form, so equilibrium shifts to the left to make more of that active form. It's turning on the enzyme, like, uh, which would be, 
you know, if we go draw this graph here, it's turning it on from the off state to the on state in terms of enzyme activity, okay? And that's, that's the simplified version, but really all you need to know about, and I'll flip to the slide so that you can see their version of it. That's basically all they're saying here. Let me zoom in. Without really talking enough about the, the, the equilibrium stuff or illustrating it, they say it right here, but that's all they're saying is that there's a substrate, it only can bind to the active form of the enzyme, and equilibrium shifts in that direction to make more of the active form. Uh, molecules that cause shifts between active and inactive are called effectors, okay? And I'll, I'll illustrate, I'll write that down here. They are called effectors. So again, effectors are molecules that affect this equilibrium between relaxed and tense, that affect this equilibrium between active and inactive. The first example of an effector we have is the substrate itself. There are, of course, others, and that's what the next diagram shows you, but I'm going to, again, hand draw it up here, and then we'll refer back to the diagram. So this is the start of it. So it's going to get a little bit more complicated now, but not, not too complicated once you understand the equilibrium shift thing. So we're going to start with this, the active form and the inactive form. And we already learned that when a substrate is added to the active form of the enzyme, you have an enzyme substrate complex, right? We already learned that. This is this, I've drawn it slightly, you know, tilted here. It's the exact same thing we drew previously. But now we're gonna add a couple other things. The substrate only goes to the active site, right? It turns out there are plenty of molecules that don't go to the active site that also regulate the equilibrium between active and inactive. I'll start simply over here. Inhibitors, which I'll label as I, inhibitors will only bind to the inactive form of an allosteric enzyme. So inhibitors prefer to bind to the inactive form of the enzyme. It makes sense, right? They, they, they want to boost how much of the enzyme is inactive, so they're only going to bind to the inactive form of the enzyme. And this creates a complex between the inactive form of the enzyme and the inhibitor. Uh, I believe the illustration they give, uh, and I don't think this is 100% always the case, but I believe this inhibitor only goes, uh, in the illustration, goes to the allosteric site of the enzyme. I don't think that's 100% true, but I'm just gonna follow the illustration and we'll summarize everything in the end so you see what I mean. But, on the illustration, they're illustrating that the inhibitor goes to an allosteric site on the enzyme. So same thing with the previous drawing we had here. How does this change equilibrium? Well, if the inhibitor binds to uh, the inactive form of the enzyme, it's going to use up the inactive form of the enzyme. And uh, due to Le Chatelier's principle and the shifting of equilibrium, equilibrium is going to shift to the, le to the right due to the presence of the inhibitor. Thus, you're making more of the inactive form out of the active form. You're converting the active form into the inactive stuff when the inhibitor is present. There's one more effector molecule you can add to this diagram, and it kind of goes in, in two places technically, and that is activators. So we didn't talk about activators with Michaelis menten enzymes, and there might be some that exist, but you don't have to know them for this class. Activators in this class, we're going to limit our discussion to allosteric enzymes. So activators are very similar to inhibitors. Activators go to allosteric sites, but boost the activity of the enzyme. So in our example here, the activator prefers to bind to the active form of the enzyme and creates a enzyme activator complex here. Same thing with the substrate up here is that this causes an equilibrium shift to the left because you are using up this active form of the enzyme, so you need to make more of it due to this equilibrium arrow here. The last uh, spot here, annoyingly, and I don't really know exactly how to draw this part. Uh, I believe there's just, yeah, there we go. Something like that. I might be missing something, of course. I always am. 
Oh, yeah, I know how this goes, okay. There we go. Do, do, do. Okay. Uh, and I'll switch over to the illustration so that you guys can see it. This is just my mess here. Is that when the substrate is present, we learn that it binds to the enzyme. And when an activator is present, we learn that it binds to the enzyme. Well, it turns out both can bind to the enzyme uh, simultaneously as well. And that's why there's this extra part here say, stating that both can be attached to the enzyme. The substrate would be at the active site and the activator would be at the allosteric site. Okay. So that is the simplification of what this diagram shows you. And uh, you know what, I'll just switch to the diagram so you guys can see what I mean. That's this thing. Ignore most of that text. I'll point out the parts that matter. All right. That is what this is telling you, is that there's activators, there's substrates. They pull equilibrium to the left. Meanwhile, inhibitors pull equilibrium to the right, and they, they have specific uh, parts of the enzyme they prefer to bind to. Now, what's important here are some vocabulary words, and I'm going to switch back to the document cam so you can see the vocabulary words I'm talking about. All right, you need to know what they mean when they say homotropic versus heterotropic. and positive versus negative. Okay, these are categories of effector molecules. All right, so effector molecules, we've listed some already, substrates, activators, and inhibitors. We can describe what these are via these vocabulary terms, which I'm gonna define right now. If a molecule, if an effector molecule is referred to as homotropic, it means it binds to the active site. And if it's heterotropic, it means it binds to an allosteric site. All right, that's pretty easy. Homotropic is similar to substrate, it goes to active site, okay? And heterotropic is it doesn't go to the active site, so what's left over is that it goes to the allosteric site instead. The phrase positive effector means it activates the enzyme. Or another way of saying is, is that it causes a shift from the tense form to the relaxed form. It causes, just the presence of a positive effector causes more active enzyme to be made. So it's a converting the tense stuff into the relaxed stuff. It's turning on the enzyme, that's the positive effector. Negative, therefore, deactivates the enzyme and is converting some of the relaxed stuff into the tense stuff instead. It's deactivating it. That is what they refer to when they, when they call a molecule a negative effector, okay? So homotropic is the effector binds to active sites. Heterotropic, the effector binds to allosteric sites. Positive effectors uh, activate the enzyme. And negative effectors deactivate the enzyme. So what combination of these words can we use to describe each of the effectors we talked about? So let's start with the substrate. Where on the enzyme did the substrate bind to? Active site. So therefore, a substrate is a homotropic effector. Okay. The binding of the substrate, did it activate or deactivate the enzyme? It activated it. So it is both homotropic and positive. I don't remember which order they usually talk about this in. Positive. Is it positive homotropic? Okay, so put that together though, the phrase positive effector indicates that the substrate activated the enzyme and the phrase homotropic effector indicated that the substrate went to the active site. So a, ho a positive homotropic effector in our example is the substrate, all right? Let's uh, do the other two effectors. I ran out of room, so I'm going to have to write on another piece of paper here. 
What about the activator molecule? Where did it bind to on our illustration? Allosteric site, right? It went to the allosteric site, therefore what term can we use to describe it? It is heterotropic, exactly. And uh, is it positive or negative? It is positive also because it activates the enzyme. It makes more of the active form. So activator molecules are positive heterotropic. Inhibitors, at least in our example, went to the allosteric site. So we can also call it heterotropic. And are they positive or negative? Negative. negative. So they are negative heterotropic effector molecules in our illustration. Yes? Yes, there can be other examples. The one, the only other example that you'll run into that doesn't fit to positive heterotropic or negative heterotropic or um, positive homotropic is uh, you can sometimes run into negative homotropic. Okay, and I'll put a star here for that. I think there's only maybe one or two examples that you have to, that you'll learn about that are negative homotropic. So what a negative homotropic effector molecule, we dissect this answer here, is that it deactivates the enzyme and it does so by binding to the active site, right? The phrase negative homotropic effector applies to some inhibitors of allosteric enzymes. And I'm going to put here, and it doesn't mean this is the exact same thing, is the closest analogy of this is competitive inhibitors. It doesn't mean they're the exact same thing, but the, close, the closest analogy for the phrase negative homotropic are competitive inhibitors, right? We learned in Michaela's Menten enzymes that competitive inhibitors also bind to the active site and inhibit the target enzyme. So some inhibitors of allosteric enzymes can actually be classified as negative homotropic. They bind to the active site of the enzyme and shut it off, okay? Uh, there are no other examples of these combinations that at least I'm aware of or you have to be aware of for this exam. So the three main ones to review, the three main ones and that one bonus one, are that substrates are positive homotropic. They bind to the active site and activate the enzyme. Activators, which are positive heterotropic, they activate the enzyme but do so by binding to an allosteric site. Most inhibitors that we talk about are negative heterotropic. They deactivate the enzyme and do so by binding to an allosteric site. However, there are some inhibitors that are negative homotropic. They deactivate the enzyme, but instead by doing so by binding to the active site of that enzyme. And when we talk about glycogen phosphorylase, I'll give you, uh, I think it's one or two examples there. All right. So these are the vocab terms when we talk about regulating uh, allosteric enzymes. Okay. Uh, any questions on uh, that breakdown? What time we got? All right, we got a couple more minutes. All right. So. Is the next one glycogen phosphorylase yet? Let's see. And I may start it at least because it's a big topic. And one of your possible extra credit questions, by the way, one of your possible extra credit questions is to explain, let me just jump to the slide first, is to explain how glycogen phosphorylase is regulated. What does it do? and all the components that regulate glycogen phosphorylase. So this slide will be your best friend if that happens to be your extra credit question. Uh, and we will talk about it in detail. I'll start it today and we will continue it uh, next SI session. So, uh, first we'll start with what glycogen phosphorylase does. So, uh, based on its name, it sounds like it has something to do with glycogen. For those that don't you know, I know he's in chapter seven and everything, but those who haven't conceptualized what glycogen is, 
it is a polysaccharide, and it is a, a way to store energy in, in, uh, that you get out of glucose. It's a way to store it in a compact form called glycogen. Well, if the body actually wants to use that glucose that's in glycogen, it needs to break down glycogen. The very first enzyme that begins the breakdown of glycogen back into glucose is the enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase. Uh, if you're studying for the MCAT, you'll learn about this enzyme when you're studying gly uh, glycogenolysis. Uh, so what this enzyme does is it begins the process of breaking down glycogen by simply attaching a phosphate to it. Okay? So that's what its function is, and that's all you need to know about its function for Biochem 1. For its regulation, that's the interesting stuff. Glycogen phosphorylase, it turns out, and this is just an intro to it, I'll explain it in detail next time. Glycogen phosphorylase, it turns out, is regulated two ways, both through covalent modification, which we learned uh, at the very beginning, and through, it says non-covalent control, but I call that through allosteric regulation. It's the same thing in this context. Non-covalent control is allosteric regulation. So glycogen phosphorylase is simultaneously regulated by both covalent modification and allosteric regulation. And because of that, you have four possible states glycogen phosphorylase can be in. Four possible states. And uh, I'll, I'll, let's, let's see if we can break down some of that here. So, up here at the very top of the diagram, you have two versions of glycogen phosphorylase, but both are referred to as T states, which we learn means what? Tense or inactive, right? So the glycogen phosphorylase at the top of this diagram is in a form that is inactive. It won't do anything, okay? The only difference between them seems to be some type of covalent modification, right? If we, the one on the left doesn't have any covalently attached phosphates to it. The one on the right does. So going from left to right or right to left on this diagram is going through covalent modification. We learned in covalent modification that the name of the enzyme that attaches phosphates uh, two things to regulate them are called kinases, and we see that here, right? If you see an enzyme name that ends in kinase, its job is to covalently attach a phosphate to something in order to regulate it. The opposite, of course, is some long name, blah, 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 phosphatase. It ends in the word phosphatase. That removes phosphates from it. So that's the top half of this diagram. I'm going to break down the left side of this diagram first because it's, it, it's basically what you learned with allosteric regulation. So if we compare the top left and the bottom left, we see that the bottom left is referred to as the R state, which we now know means relaxed or the active form of, uh, of glycogen phosphorylase in this example. And we see that there's an equilibrium arrow and there's a bunch of these uh, molecules here that cause uh, glycogen phosphorylase to either shift from inactive to active or from active back into inactive and where they are positioned on the arrows tells you which way it shifts it these are your effector molecules that we learned about right positive negative homotropic heterotropic all of that though these are your effector molecules that that uh, affect the the shift in equilibrium from active state to inactive state amp is a, is a, well, I'll ask this, is AMP, based on this diagram, is a positive or a negative effector? What is it doing? Which direct, what is it causing a shift in? It's a positive effector because it's drawn on the left here. Let me zoom in, maybe you can't see the arrow. It's on the left here. It's telling you that AMP causes a shift to produce active form of glycogen phosphorylase. We learned that, that if it's making more of the active stuff, it must be a positive effector. Look at how many negative effectors there are. The ones on the right of this uh, area right here, they're, they're all on the side of the arrow that's pointing back into the inactive form of this enzyme. ATP, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose, and caffeine are all uh, negative effectors. You might ask, well, what about homotropic and heterotropic? So what this enzyme does is it takes the substrate, which is glycogen, and uh, attaches a phosphate to it. So its substrate is glycogen. AMP doesn't look anything like glycogen, so AMP is going to bind to the allosteric site. So because it binds to the allosteric site, what term will we use to describe AMP? Heterotropic, 
ATP doesn't look anything like glycogen. Same reasoning. We're going to call that one heterotrophic. Caffeine doesn't look anything like glycogen, so that one is also heterotropic. Glucose and glucose 6-phosphate are a little bit different, right? Glycogen is made of a bunch of glucose molecules put together. It turns out that glucose and glucose 6-phosphate are similar enough to the structure of glycogen that glucose and glucose 6-phosphate actually bind to the active site of this of glycogen phosphorylase in order to inhibit it. Therefore, what term would you use if they bind to the active site? Homotropic. So this is the example I have for negative homotropic effectors are, and these are the only ones that you ever learn about uh, for this class, are glucose and glucose 6-phosphate. They're your negative homotropic effectors. All right? So we'll finish the explanation off next SI session, and I'll uh, post the video as soon as YouTube is able to process it.